Hi everybody, I'm BJ. I'm the genealogy librarian at the Maine State Library. And today I'm going to do the third and last part of my program on reading old documents, paleography. And so I'm gonna pick up where we left off last week, which was talking about calendars. Um, so let me share, I'm sharing my screen. Let's start the slideshow from where we left off last week. Um, and so last week I was talking about, and I'm going to repeat this because it's something people sometimes have trouble with. Um, oops, where are we? Why is this not? Until 1752 in England or 1600 in Scotland, um, oops, and I just, um, new, the new year for the calendar purposes started on March 25th, which is also called Lady Day. Um, so March was considered the first month, even though it was the 25th that was Lady Day. And so what happened was at this point, January and February would have actually been numbered for the previous year. And sometimes you will actually get clerks that double date something, which is very helpful because this is a case, it was February 19th. And it's 1734 old style or 1735 new style, which is the way we're doing it. So for us, if you were entering this in a program that doesn't deal well with double dates, you would enter it as 1735, but they would have thought of it as 1734. Okay. And it's, it's basically just sort of picture the calendar tilted two months. Um, and this is a hard one to get through your head. I've seen it a lot of mistakes in people transcribing dates, putting them in a book. So if something looks weird where it looks like you have babies too close together or something like that, if one of the dates is in January or February, it may well be this issue. Um, the other thing that happened when they, in 1752, when they adjusted the calendar, in September, they took out um, 11 days to switch to keep things in track with the, with the solar year so that September kept the, the um, autumn, September and October stayed in the autumn, the, the summer solstice stayed in June and didn't move eventually into May and so on. So um, that's something to be on the watch for when you're dealing with you know, online trees, pu published books, things like that. Um, so the American colonies followed the, the, the English 1752 change for all of that. One thing that you don't really see much in the US, but if you get back into English records, there were special days in the calendar. Um, and one of them was Lady Day. You had Midsummer was tw June 24th. Michaelmas was 20, the 29th of September and Christmas was the 25th of December. And these were often when rents were due or when people changed employment. Um, so you will see references to them in pretty much in, in 18th century and earlier records. By the 19th century, you're not seeing them that much, but you will see them in um, earlier records sometimes. Um, 
Scotland used a slightly different set um, of days, but it was the same ideas. They were there were four days that divided the year into quarters, <coughs> and they were when people did tend to change jobs or move, um, pay their rents, pay their taxes, and so on. One of the other things that happens in dating, especially if you get into legal um, documents, court records and such, is you'll see things dated by what are called regnal years. And basically a monarch's first regnal year starts on the day they ascend to the throne and ends 365 or 366 days later. So Victoria became queen on June 20th, 1837. So if you were to see something labeled 45 Vic, it happened in between June 1881, June 20th, 1881, and June 19th, 1882. I will give you the good news. There are online calculators for this. You do not have to do it in your brain because if you had to, I'd be completely sunk. Um, but just so, you, and, and often the monarch's name, you'll see Vic or Geo for George um, and so on. So that I just wanted to show you, and here's a will, um, it's actually in Latin, but here you have in the, um, I think it's something in ninth year of the reign of Queen Anne. So you will see that. Does that make sense how they do that? Okay, currency. Um, British pounds had 20 shillings per pound, and there were 12 pence per shilling, which meant there were 240 pence per pound. And you will see British currency with three numbers. And what's interesting is even though the dollar became the official currency of the US in 1792, you will see continuing later than that, pounds, shillings, and D is the symbol for pence coming from the, the Latin denarii, denarii, which was the Latin word for penny. And so, you know, here you have these are tax records from you know, 1790 through 1794. And you will see they're still using the British pound, shilling, pence. Here's a um, newspaper from 1801. And it's not clear to me on this one because it says a thousand pounds whether they just didn't have, a, they used this because they didn't have a dollar sign for this typeface, or if it was really in pounds. Whereas this one, I can tell it's still using pounds, shilling, pence, because you have the three-way split. So, you know, here you have one pound, two shillings, and no pen, and no pennies or pence. Does that make sense to everybody that it took a good 10 to 15 years before the dollar really became um, used completely? The other two things you will see um, in British currency is you'll see a guinea, um, which is 21 shillings or one pound, one shilling. Um, so if you see that, if you see something in guineas, that's what that is. 
And then until 1707, um, Scott's currency was of a different value than um, the pound ster the pound Scots was different than pound sterling. Um, and there was a ratio and a Scott shilling was worth about an English penny in 1603. Um, so after 1707, Scotland still has its own currency, but it's pegged to one pound Scots is one pound sterling. Um, and it's not used on the international market, but if you're in Scotland, you get Scottish pounds in um, as the currency. And what's always interesting is if you have Scottish pounds, which are equal to the pound sterling throughout the UK, the further south you get in England, the less likely shops are likely to want to take it, even though it's completely legal tender. Um, so that's just something if you're dealing with before 1707 to realize that you need to know whether you're dealing with pound Scots or pound sterling if you're trying to calculate value. Weights and measures. Um, not going to say too much here. It's big and complicated. There are all sorts of measures, um, and some of them are different. Depend it, the um, the measures for whiskey were different than the measures for beer. Um, and various other things like that. I end up just using Google or I put um, on the handout that I gave you last week or the week before, there are um, places you can go that to explain everything. But you're going to get into perches and rods for land um, measures you've got barrels and pecks and other things for measuring flour or corn or anything like that and basically it's just it you, the easiest thing is to actually just look up through your favorite search engine um what the weights would have been because there's so many of them and they vary um by the item being measured that it would I would have to spend oh, the whole hour um, talking about that. Oh yeah, I the cross quarter days, sorry, I, I should have talked about those very briefly. They are just the days sort of in between these. Um, they're more traditional days. These are based on the Christ, on the Christian calendar, um, whereas these are based on the the pre-Christian um, Celtic pagan days. Um, and the the two sets divide the year into eight parts because you'll see these. You know, this one fits in kind of nicely between these two, and this one fits in between these two. Um, and they were often days where there were um, festivals or fairs, you know, May Day and Lamas, you know, Lamas Day was sort of the, 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 the fair day right before harvest time. May Day was the fair after planting and so on. Um, you know, and you'll recognize All Hallows Day because the day before is Halloween, All Hallows Eve. So that's that's what they were. Was that's that's a lingering um, before these were important dates before England was Christianized. So let's talk a little. One of the other things that happened was you get. Oh, so another question. Yes, there are calculators for historical currency conversion. Um, and when I flip to um, showing you things online, I will show you one of those. 
just remind me if I forget. Um, one of the things you'll see a lot of in older documents, and I pulled these because they were easy to find, is abbreviations. When you're writing everything by hand, especially words that are frequent, you're going to want to save some handwriting. And so these are various um, abbreviations for men's names. And so often what you'll get is you'll get the first letter or two or three, and then a superscript of the last letter of the name. So here for Robert, you get R-O-B and a superscript T. William, you get the W with an M, and sometimes you get two dots there. Um, John is interesting because it's J-N-O. Um, in most cases. Um, Joseph is J-O-S. Daniel, again, you have D-A-N with a superscript L. You'll often see other things like the administrator of a, a will. You will often see is A-D-M superscript R or A-D-M-I-N superscript R. Um, executor, other things like that. You sometimes will see dates abbreviated. But just so you know that if you see dots like this or superscript, it probably means the word's been abbreviated. And you may need to figure out what word it is from that. Um, does that make sense to everybody why they did that? You know, if you were a clerk writing 50 or 100 pages a day, you'd want to come up with shortcuts. Plus, paper was very expensive, so abbreviations helped shorten documents. Another thing you'll see is people who weren't adept writing will often make their mark. Um, sometimes they would just make an X, um, but often you will get things like here's a Nicholas Stilwell, and his mark was a backwards N. Or, you know, here's Richard Hill. Um, they, if somebody made their mark, they weren't necessarily illiterate. Um, there were points where reading and writing were not, you know, we tend to see them as one skill, that if you can read, you can write, and vice versa. There were times in, in history where they were much more separated as skills. And so there will sometimes be people who are literate, but make a mark. Um, I've also seen cases where as people age, you know, if they end up with arthritis or Parkinson's or something, you will see that towards the end of their life, they make a mark, even though they'd signed things earlier in their life. Um, here you have, you know, you have this text, and you can see there are some people who signed. And generally, what will you'll get is somebody, when they make their mark, you will get the first name, on one side and the last name on the other. And often it will say his mark or her mark underneath. And I'm guessing most of you have already seen this somewhere, but that's what that is. Um, and again, you know, here you have a Richard Gray or Gay, and his mark is a backwards R. Here's someone who did just use an X. Um, here's someone whose name is John Bramham. He uses a, a sort of stylized B and so on. So let's do a little practice here. Now, one of the things I've said is you really need context for things. So I'm going to give you context here by giving you little pictures. So feel free to unmute yourself at this point or type in the chat. 
So let's take a look at this. This is not a great illustration, but any clue what this word might be? It looked, the picture looked like a book, so I was thinking book binder, but. No. A blank book? It's not a book. Oh, is okay. A, is it a brick? Nope. It's something you'd find in your bedroom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I can guarantee uh, you uh, all is have... Is it a bed warmer? Nope. Blanket. Hey, good Blanket. Guess. Blanket. <laughs> Blanket. Wow. Blanket. <laughs> but look at, you know, yeah, it's a, cr this one's a crappy illustration, but... Yeah. Um, but you, you see you have the B, L, two little letters, K, yeah. little letter, T. Oh, wow. Okay. So what about this? We have three words here. Horse, Horse and Horse. harness? Yep. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. What about this one? Wheel. 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 Yeah. And again, notice you, 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 some of it is you're kind of looking at the ups and downs. Here's a fun one. Chamber pot? Nope. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Hold that thought. Uh -oh. no. It's kind of big. <laughs> uh, uh, you got the pot right. Uh, it's the one they cooked over the fire, wasn't it? Right. So what was it made of? Iron. Iron, Iron pot. Iron, Iron pot. Wow. Okay, so here's another great, not great illustration, but bacon. Bacon. Good. Wow. <laughs> I wouldn't have got that one. <laughs> okay. So it looks like a spoon. Yeah, so you've got an S P O O N E. Jeez. Oh, that's the chamber pot, the next one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a big teacup. <laughs> well, that's what they looked like. Yeah. You got to carry it notice you've got, you know, <laughs> Notice on a lot of these that the, the where the spelling really differs is yeah. at the end of the word. Yeah. Okay. This has been, you know, you lop off the extra T. Yeah. yeah. So any yeah. idea what this is cup. just a cup <laughs> right how about this one candlestick right again you know s's okay. get really stylized and funny you know and tough to figure out um any idea what this says wood yeah. chair yep last one tub oh. yep you guys are good I didn't get chair. What was the last one? Tub. Oh, tub. Yeah. With two B's at the end. How do you get chair out of the previous one? Here's C H A Y R E. Oh, that's a C. <laughs> <laughs> it just that's what it looks like to me. <laughs> the, the way you know this is again, you've got the the H. So you know this can only be a limited number of letters. If this is not going to be a B, for example. No. Oh. It's like a crossword puzzle. Yeah. It is. Um, so here's a fun one. This next one I found online, and it stumped a professional genealogist for a while. What is the name of it? all sorts of documents about this man, Sands Standle. And only one thing that named his wife. Like only... And so the question is what, and I've given you a hint with something I've said today. Um, so obviously we can read her last name. Is yeah. this Standle or Stanley? So what's her name? It's not Margaret something, is it? No. Margaret, 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 Margaret,
So you've got Mrs. Okay. And these two dots say it's the abbreviation. Remember okay. I said they often yeah. put. So, so any ideas what this letter might be? Trace it out with your hand. Is it a D? Nope. It's a, it's a capital letter. It's the first letter in her a. name. Okay. Yeah. A. a. Oh, A. A. Now, yeah. after A, are you going to have a consonant or a vowel in most cases? Consonant. Right. So what consonant could this... Let me turn on the laser pointer a here. A-C? Or A-L. 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 So we've got A-L. Eliza. Yeah. A Wayne, you got it. Good for you. Eliza. So Eliza. it's Eliza. Ah, uh, Eliza. But, you know, but oh, picture e. Eliza with a southern A L A H Z A H. Uh, man, that's a tough one. But yeah, so don't feel bad. This professional genealogist took a couple years to realize this was Mrs. Yeah. and not part of her name. <laughs> But you know, this is the clue here. Yeah. The two I dots guess. that there was something abbreviated here. Okay. So good job, you guys. Oh, you wow. got good it. Good job, Wayne. Yay. Yay. <laughs> yeah, so you said the first letter was A, right? Yeah. Uh, what, what would the cross be for? Well, what think about when you do an A and you have the middle piece. This is just squished in, so it looks like a T. Yeah. But think of a, a, a print capital A yeah. that yeah. looks like an upside down V with a cross piece. So this is the upside down V with the cross piece. I still don't get it. The whole thing is a capital A. It's not a yeah. small A. So look yeah. at this A here. Okay. And they just squished it. It's squished. Okay. So okay. this this A has a little flourish here, goes up like this, down like that, and then was crossed. A like that. Right. <laughs> okay. Hey, people oh, I never would have read anything. <laughs> <laughs> but you would have learned, you know, this is what you would have learned. Oh. Years ago, I read a, a time travel romance style book where this guy comes forward in time from um, like 14 or 1500 and he has a hard time reading and the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the woman he's interacting with thinks he's illiterate because he's having a hard time reading modern script, you know, modern printed stuff. Yeah. And it's only when she goes back in time later that she noted, she figures out, hey, it's not that he was illiterate or stupid. It's that he just is used to a very different style, style of writing. Yeah. Just like, you know, I know I struggled, struggled to get through old German Proctor, but if that's what you're used to, you're going to be able to read it. Um, okay. That's like that Portuguese handwriting that I that I sent you a copy of. Yeah, oh, and right. that's actually that leads right into my one next comment: is everything I've talked to you about so far is England, Scotland, Ireland, and if you end up getting back to Italy or France or Germany or Spain or Portugal, you will want to look up Portuguese paleography, Spanish paleography, Italian paleography, because there will be considerable differences in the styles in different parts of Europe. Just like it varies over time in England, it varied over place. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So, so let me stop sharing this screen for a moment. Well, I, 
get out of the PowerPoint. And let me pull up. So um, any questions at this point? No? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna answer first a question. There are online currency converters. The one I'm gonna show you is from the um, UK National Archives. So let me share my screen again. So let's say um, we'll put in one pound, three shillings, and oh, seven pence. And then what it's going to do more than, um, oh, select a year. So let's select 1620, the year the Mayflower sailed. Um, so with one pound, three shillings, and seven pence, you couldn't buy a horse or it's a, worth approximately conversion wise, 155 pounds, which today is just over 200 US dollars, I think. But it's, this is the one that you should really look at to get a good view. Um, it got you 23 days of work. It's what you got paid for 23 days of work as a skilled tradesman. Um, so let's put in another, let's put in a higher value just to see. So when you get up to, with 10 pounds, you could buy one horse or five cows. And you'd get over half a year. You know, so I'm guessing if we did, let's try about 17 pounds. So it looks like a, a skilled tradesman at that point would have probably made 17 to 19 pounds for the year. Um, and so this is the one I like. Um, just because it does give you, some of them just give you this, which really doesn't tell you much. Um, but this, this is, for me, this is the easy way to picture how much something was, was, you know, when, when you're talking skilled tradesmen, you're, you're talking coupender, carpenter, um, shoemaker, things like that. And an agricultural laborer would have made a little less than that. Um, see, I'm, I'm guessing at this point, you know, let's say that um, from what I've read, if this is, if let's say 20 pounds, just to make it easy, is the skilled tradesman, your agricultural, you know, experienced agricultural laborers probably making 17 and a, young man just starting out might be making 12 for the year. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, and this is just, all I did was I, I Google, I used Google to go um, historical currency calculator. And there are others. Um, let's Keep, come on. Here's one for US dollar value, but it's only 20th century um, and some others. But this, this one that comes up from the, the National Archives it is a pretty handy one that way. So let me just show you a couple other things here. Um, 
this is pretty typical. Um, I'm showing you this because you know, a lot of what I've been showing you is older, but this is from the 1850s and it's really stylized. It's very pretty, but you will still have to work out um, what things say here. So, you know, don't get frustrated even if you, um, things that are fairly recent that look like you should be able to read them. I mean, I occasionally come across some modern person's handwriting that I practically have to use my paleography skills on. So don't get frustrated if, you know, you find something here that looks like this and you're still having to do some of the um, figuring out and comparing it to elsewhere in um, the document to figure out what it says. Um, what was, I don't know what that was. Oh. Um, this is actually from the Nat Natural History Museum um, and has, actually I'll put this in the chat. I, I downloaded a copy. So let me put this in the chat for you. Um, where is it? Um, because it actually has um, some fairly good, where are we? Not seeing it right off the top of my head. There we go. Um, and one of the things I liked about this, in addition to some of these things, now obviously these are aimed at um, what you might see in um, more natural history type documents, but It does, for example, have some of the, the, the weights and measures, um, you know, barrels and bushels, um, a peck, pint, and so, oh, I sent that to the wrong thing, sorry. There you go. Um, so it has some good information in it. You probably, you know, it's 27 pages long. You might not want to. Oh, and one of the other, the other reason I pulled this up, um, remember when I said paper was expensive? This is also something you will sometimes see where somebody writes this way on the paper and then they turn it and write this way. And it's called cross writing and it, the way I deal with it is I make a copy and I highlight the lines in this direction and then on a separate copy, I highlight them in the other direction because that helps me focus on which layer I am um, looking at. This is an older sheet of paper. I don't know why paper was blue. I think it was just that the to get it white is an extra step of bleaching if i remember correctly um and so they probably you know probably didn't do that um so yeah the the cross writing is something that that can be um difficult to read so but, and you don't find this, you don't tend to find this in, in 
legal documents or other thing, you know, church registers. This is something you're likely to find in, in letters and journals and other more personal writings. So there's that. Um, this is from the Cambridge University, and this is on the uh, the main page for this is on your um, the handout. So here are the sample transcriptions, and let's take a look. Actually, I wanted this one. Um, and I think I need to stop sharing. Whoops. And screen share. And this one. I like this one for practice because they give you this panel right here where you can type in. Um, what's here. So if you want to practice, this is a good, um, the, the Cambridge samples are a good way to do that. Um, they also give you um, some information about when, how they dated it. And again, just looking at what's on the screen, you can see you know, fairly basic Ds at the end of the word. Um, you can see the, the abbreviation, the old thorn with an E for the. Um, you can see here, you know, some random capitalization. Um, extra E's on the end, thou great commander of the all go nots, and left the something behind with an extra E. So that's, um, very helpful. So let me go back and share the other screen. Um, come on. So one of the other things here is, um, at the, the, Cambridge website. You know, I talked last week about transcriptions, and they've got some more um, details about that um, and how you know, using square brackets to um, look at you know, what's not there and such. And again. I probably didn't emphasize this enough, but up until the 1630s, U and V were interchangeable and I and J were often interchangeable for the letters on the page. I mentioned this I think last week or the week before, but I don't think I said it as, um, careful, you know, as, as obviously is that. Um, and it's really only in, in, in about the middle of the 17th century, you really see these letters diverge. Um, and then you've got the, the thorn um, here and that shape. Um, and again, like with a couple things I showed you, you often get ES where we would just put S on the end to make something plural. Um, and often you get something up or above or below the line. Um, like we saw in, in that spoon or spoons in the case of, you know, there was the, you'll get this S will also be sort of stylized and so on. Um, so that's handy. Um, BYU has a script tutorial. 
Um, let's take a look at this one. And again, what's interesting here is this is before the dollar was the official currency in seven, the early 1790s. And they're talking about dollars and parts. And parts is what eventually becomes pennies. Um, and again, you get um, names. Now, these are all mostly written out. Um, and so, but you would be able to figure out, you know, like often the T and the F, the only difference is that line across. Um, and so if you weren't sure what letter this was and there wasn't another T, you could figure out this is an F because it's February. And notice here you've got Feb with the superscript Y as an abbreviation. Here you have December is DEC superscript R. Now notice here there's an F without its cross mark. Um, so, you know, people did make mistakes. Um, so, this is, you know, fairly typical handwriting. Um, because of who settled early in the, the um, in what became the U.S., there is some tendency that the, um, earlier than this, but from say 1620 through about 1720, the handwriting is going to be somewhat simpler in um, the American colonies because both the Puritans and the Quakers tended to not do the, the fancy stylized court or secretary hand. They tended to do a more, the more basic um, writing. Um, so yeah, oh, this is the cover page of the Cambridge. It's not an exciting cover page. Um, or, no, that's their the alphabets. Um, and I have this up to show you. Oh, and it popped up in a separate window, so I'm not going to do that. Um, Scottish handwriting has um, a lot of samples if you want to um, work on, and I would suggest starting with the more recent ones. And what they do, which I like, instead of just having you transcribe it, they ask you a question about understanding it. So, you know, how many tables were in this inventory? Um, and if you're going to do this, I would suggest starting with the most recent one and working your way back, because the more recent you are, the easier it will be to read. Um, this is Yale's rare book and manuscript library. Again, they have some that um, come on. Um, you know, absolutely gorgeous handwriting, but you have to um, work your way through it. So this is this indenture made the blank day of blank. Um, in the reign of our sovereign lord, King Charles the second. And so that's a regnal, that's going to be a regnal date. Um, so, you know, and obviously there's some level of someone was writing out boilerplate here. Um, but I, I wanted to show you this one to show you, you know, they've written out the, for the, the boiler, the, the, the regnal year. 
Um, here's one from 1673. The East India Company sold their T-H-E-Y-R goods at something. And I, if I were transcribing this, I would just put brackets and guess G and four other letters, sales. This, they half employed, so again, you get the older H-A-T-H. -H, and notice even in the same, well, no, I guess that was, you, you do get slightly different H's in the same word. Employed some of those vast sums of money they have that that have something in london out of request so you know it it takes some time you know i'm doing this just looking and it, i would and so if i were transcribing this i would write what this is up at the top um, and I would write it exactly as it is here. Now, depending, if I were using this for my own purposes, sometimes I will skip a line in between and then write it in modern English in between in a different color, you know, in purple or red. Um, and then, you know, when I'm transcribing, I would just, you know, I would only, if this is three words, that's all I put on that line. I would not start, I would start the next line on the next line of, of the page. Um, and there are two reasons for that. One is it, in case it turns out there's a break that's important. But the other thing is then as you're going back and trying to figure things out, if it makes it easier to figure out where in the document something was instead of having longer lines. So again here, you know, I would just put the England on one line and then start this on the next line. So let's see what else. That's this one. And here's another one from a sim similar, this may even be the same person writing. The two apprentices to a tailor in Grimborne Street have something of their master's children in their hands. So again, you know, if I were transcribing this, I would put the date on its own line. Um, and something like this, again, I put in brackets, and I think this is probably born B-O-U-R-N-E, but I'm not certain. But because it says street, I might be able to go and find a list of streets in London at this time and be able to figure this out. Um, and here we have one in Castle Street. Um, so that's, um, the National Archives, in addition to having that nice, um, calculator for historic stuff, does have guides for, um, this is as much the history of the documents as it is paleography, but it gives you <coughs> information about what you're going to find in the document to give you some ideas about what words you might find. So I figured, you know, if you're getting back into earlier, although some of these go into the, the well into the 1800s, here's the, um, the criminal trials one goes into the 20th century about what you're likely to find, um, and so on. So again, this was on the handout, so you can look at that.
um, because you know, often with the document, knowing why it was created and what it's likely to contain in terms of what it's documenting can help you figure out what words are in front of you. Um, and then also the University of Nottingham has a very good um, breaking these out. And this is in the handout. Um, with what you're going to find in what thing types of documents. Oh, and that that's just the transcription of one of these. So let me stop sharing. So any questions at this point? I have one question, BJ. When we were looking back at the um, entries you were showing us for the poorhouse, on the right-hand column, a couple of the entries look like by her husband. I'm wondering, was that poor person committed by her own husband to the poorhouse? Well, actually, that was that was an asylum, not the poorhouse. So yeah, she was. Those women were committed to the the lunatic asylum by their husband. Oh, it was a oh, lunatic. Oh wow! I bet you they never got out of there. Yeah, it's not unusual. Some of them okay. did, and some of them didn't. And often the conditions were such that even if they didn't belong there to start with, after they'd been there a while, they needed to be. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, oh, okay. <laughs> um, now others, you know, I, I've also found, you know, you get similar records for um, physical health sanitariums um, where you will find a spouse has committed somebody for TB or other diseases. They also had a question about settlement. Uh, and that was in the four, four house ones, and there was one that said settled. And I, I don't know if that means what town they're from or... Yeah. yeah. The, um, if they were a pauper and sent to an asylum, um, the town they were settled in where they had legal residence was then liable for the fee needed to maintain that person. And there, there, there were, there were um, complicated and in-depth laws about when, how somebody got settled in a town and how to change which town you were settled in and all sorts of things like that. And actually that's a good, because here in New England, they called them, it called it warning out. I may actually do a whole program. I can probably do most of an hour on how people were settled and warned out. So that may, <laughs> because it does help you track sometimes where they came from because there are documents that say, you know, this person's not one of us. They came from such and such a town and we're sending them back. Um, so, you know, it's just like now, you know, you get, if, if you move from Maine to New Hampshire and you're getting anything approaching welfare benefits, you don't necessarily get them just as soon as you move over the border. Um, so same thing happened when you had um, poor laws that were based on parish boundaries and the, the local church didn't you know, didn't want to have to pay for somebody who didn't belong to them. So other questions? Okay, so let me stop the recording.